Hilchis Nedarim, Perek Achad Asar, the Laws of Vows, Chapter 11. Forgive the noise behind us. A little bit of liveliness happening in Shul after Shachris as is usual. The Ramam begins today a topic that's going to go for the next three days till we finish these laws. And that's related to the special rights of certain relatives to nullify the vows of their relatives. A father to nullify the vows of his daughter. A husband to nullify the vows of his wife. And the way that Ammam introduces these laws is by talking about the power of children to make vows. So we begin with children under bar and bas mitzvah. Then we're going to transfer to a girl who's just after bas mitzvah. And then we're going to transfer to a girl who's in the state of marriage and then um, engage and then, and then fully marry. <clears throat> so the Ramam begins halacha aleph. Katan ben shtei mesre shana v'yem echad uktana bas achas esre shana v'yem echad. You have a male child who's 12 years old, and one day, in other words, he's finished 12 full years, or a female child, a girl, who is 11 years old and one day old. Shanishbu and they take a vow or an oath. Bein nidrei isar, bein nidrei hekdish, whether it's the first category of vows, simply prohibiting foods upon themselves, or vows of holiness, a vow to bring a sacrifice. Because they're not bar mitzvah yet, we need to ask them. We need to check them out and, a- and see what was their intent. If they know for whose sake they made a vow or an oath, in other words, they understand that Hashem is involved in making their vow or oath holy, their vows are maintained, their consecration is a consecration. But if they didn't know, they just heard people making vows, so they figured it's also fun, we'll also make a vow. They're 12 and 11 already, but their words mean nothing. Their vows mean nothing. On the other hand, even if it's revealed that they do know what they're saying, they need to be checked again every time, all year. The girl, while she's in her 12th year, the boy, while he's in his 13th year, has to be checked each and every time. What does that mean? Three days after the boy turns 12, he makes a vow, makes a, makes a, a, a hekdish, a, a consecration. You ask the boy and the girl, why did you make the vow? They say, oh, we did it for Hashem. They know. They know what it, what it means. And so their vow was, was certified. And then later, a couple of months later, they're older already. You think they're more mature. They made another vow even towards the end of the year. They have to be checked again. And only then will their vow be certified again. We don't say, since it was found that they knew in the beginning of the year, so now later in the year, they don't have to be checked. We have to check them the entire year. As the commentaries explained, the Rebbe once spoke about this. For a child, there's no such thing as chazaka. Chazaka means presumption. For an adult, you say, once he knew something now, probably he keeps knowing it a couple of months later. With a kid, their mind is always fluctuating. What they know yesterday, they may not know in two months from now. Before this time, in other words, before they reach age 12 for a boy or age 11 for a girl, even if they say, we know for whose sake we made a vow or for whose sake we made a consecration, their vows and their consecrations mean nothing. Before 12, there's zero meaning or significance to their vows. The Achar Azman on the other hand, after this time passes, in other words, the boy or the girl reached Bar Bas Mitzvah. Now in Halacha, we know that there's two elements to becoming uh, physically, mat- physically mature. You have to reach age 13, Plus, you have to manifest physical signs of maturity, pubic hairs. So usually, to be considered a full adult in Jewish law, you need both. You have to have reached the proper age, and your body has to manifest itself in the, in the physical mature ways. When it comes to vows, just the age is what matters. Once they reach age 13 or age 12, even though at this point they say, we don't know for whose sake we made a vow or a consecration. Their words are lasting, their consecration is a consecration, their vow is a vow. Here it is, even though they didn't produce two pubic hairs. This is this, the expression in the Talmud, onat nedarim. Onat nedarim means 
the time frame where vows are viable even though the boy and the girl haven't produced physical maturity yet. This is called, according to the Rambam, Mufla Hasamuch Le'ish. A boy who is just about to become a full man. He's already reached Bar Mitzvah, but he hasn't fully developed his body. Same thing for the girl. For vows, as a special rule. Once they reach the year when usually you're considered to be a full adult, their vows are lasting. Even though they haven't produced the physical signs, and therefore they're not considered to be full adults for every matter. For vows, it's special. The davar zemid divrei teira. This is a biblical concept. Shah mufla hasamuch leish hekdesha hekdesh v'nidrei neder. That a boy close to the age of adulthood, his consecration is a consecration. His vow is a vow, and of course, once he reaches full physical maturity, his vows are for sure binding. Afal pishen idrei and kayamin says that Amam you should know. In the case of the boy and the girl, even though their vows are binding, im chilulun nidra and nishbu v'achlifu, if they themselves desecrated the vows or swore and acted against their, their oath, they don't get lashes till they're a full, full adult. Because punishments can only be inflicted on a full, full adult. If they made something holy, comes another adult and enjoys the consecration which they made holy. There's a special prohibition, it's called mi'ila, sacrilege. You're not allowed to use anything which was sanctified for the, to, to the temple. So if the boy or the girl after reaching 13, but before producing physical signs of maturity. They made something holy. So for them, they could desecrate their own vow. But the object became fully holy. So if somebody else benefits from it, like he gets lashes, because their vows are binding biblically, as we explained. And now we transfer, having learned the laws of the, small, of the young girl, we're going to transfer from here to understanding her relationship to her father or to her future husband in terms of nullifying her vows. When do we say that once a girl reaches 12 years old, her vows are automatically certified? In a scenario where she was neither in the domain of her father or in the domain of her husband. In other words, she didn't have a husband. She wasn't married yet, and her father had died. But if at 12 years old, she's still in the jurisdiction of her father, even if she became a full adult, and she's therefore in the category of na'ara, remember this chart, a, a girl, once she's born, she's called a kitana. At 12 years old, if she produces physical signs, she's called a na'ara for six months. After six months, she becomes a bogeret, a full major. So even though she's reached 12 years old, and even though she's produced physical signs of maturity, and, she, and so she's a na'ara, but since she's in her father's jurisdiction, aviha mefer kol nadareha v'chol her father has the right to nullify all of her vows and all of her oaths as long as he nullifies it on the day that he hears about it. Shanemar, this is a special law which says, Kol all of her vows and all of her prohibitions go into the father's right. As the, as the verse con con concludes, Ki because her father withheld her. This is the verse over here in the beginning of Parshas Matos. It says, if the father withholds her on the day he hears, then any vows that she makes, lo yakum. They don't have any lasting effect because her father, heini, heini means mana. He, he, he held her back from making the vow. Da'ad masay aviha mefer. Says that Ammam, until when does the father hold sway in the way that he can nullify his daughter's vows? Ad shetivgar, till she reaches the age of bogerat. So it's quite a small time frame, really from, from when she's born till when she turns 12 and a half, six months after reaching state of physical maturity. Bagra, once she becomes a Bogeret, she becomes a full major. He can no longer nullify her vows. She may as well be considered a divorcee or a widow. All of her vows and prohibitions are in her own jurisdiction. About which it says. The Torah clearly says that if a woman is divorced or, or widowed, Koil asher astra al nafsha yakum aleha. Whatever she forbids unto herself has to be maintained. So because she's out of the father's domain, same laws apply to this bogeret. She makes a vow, she's got to keep it. That's the father. The father has the, the rights from when she's born till when she leaves his domain at adulthood or at marriage. When does the husband pick up on that right? And now he's allowed to nullify his wife's vows and oaths. Misha tikonis la chupa. The moment she goes into the chupa, remember from the fourth book of the Rambam, that there are two stages in a Torah marriage. Erosin, husband gives the woman a ring, 
she's betrothed, she cannot marry another man, but she isn't fully married to this man. Once the husband does nisuin, second stage, takes her into a private room and lives with her as married, now this is called nisuin. So that's the stage where the husband begins to own his wife fully in the sense that he can nullify her vows. And from then on, he can always nullify her vows. Till he divorces her and the divorce document actually reaches her hand. But if she was only divorced out of doubt, there are many cases that we saw in the laws of divorce where it's a doubtful divorce. Something was written wrong, you threw it to her, it didn't reach her. Different cases. So since, in a way, at least partially, she's divorced, the husband no longer has the rights to nullify her vows. If a husband gives the wife a divorce on a condition or that it's only going to take effect after a certain time, he may not nullify her vows in the interim days because he's already removed some of his jurisdiction over her. And also in the unfortunate case where a woman hears the news that her husband is dead. She thinks that he's dead. She remarries and then it turns out that he's actually alive in which case she must get divorced from both husbands. Once that information comes to light, neither the first or the second husband can nullify her vows. Interestingly, on the other hand, if the woman that he's married to was forbidden to him by a negative commandment, needless to say, if she's only forbidden at a positive commandment, as we had these different categories in the laws of marriage. Let's say a mamzer, is a case of a chayav elavin. It's forbidden by a negative commandment. But a high priest marrying a virgin woman is only forbidden by dint of an assay, because it says that he has to marry a betula, he has to marry a virgin, from which itself understood that he cannot marry a woman who's not a virgin. So if these types of marriages took place, even though it's against the Torah, but because the marriages are still binding legally, if the husband who is engaged in this forbidden marriage nullifies the wife's vows, the vows are indeed nullified. And now we move on to a category that's going to occupy us till the end of the chapter, which is called Nara Meurasa. A woman is a Nara, which means she's still in the state where she's in her father's jurisdiction. She's reached the age of 12. She's produced physical signs of maturity, but she's within those six months when she's still called a Nara. And during those six months, she got engaged. She was betrothed to a man not fully married. So neither one now is holding on to her fully. She's on her way out of her father's jurisdiction, but only on her way in to her husband's jurisdiction. So there's a special halacha that's written clearly in the Torah. Nara meurasa, a girl who is engaged. Ein mefer nedareha ela ha'av im habal ke'echad. You need to have both men who are having a sway over her right now nullify her vows. This is our picture. You have the girl, she has the ring. She's already been betrothed. This man is the arus. He is the, 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 the future, the prospective chatan, the prospective groom. And here's the father who's still holding on to his daughter. They both need to nullify the vow. If only one of them nullifies the vow, the vow is not nullified. If only the future husband nullified the vow. And the woman desecrated her own vow. Before her father has a chance to nullify it, she does not get lashes because we, in this way we do treat the husband's nullification as pretty strong, strong enough to take away the lashes from her. And now we're going to go into many variations of different cases that involve the husband, the future husband and the father. The, the, the father and the Baal. The yes. Both have to do it together. Yes. How old is she at this point? She's 12. Between 12 and 12 and a half. During the six-month period after she produced physical signs of maturity before she fully leaves her father's domain. So... We're going to have many different variations of cases that are going to involve the husband, the father, who heard, who didn't hear, someone died before they heard, someone died before they can nullify, multiple different variations, cases, and all the laws that apply to them. It says that Amma Malacha Yud, Meis Ha'arus, if the prospective husband dies, the basic din is, Chazra Shusaviya, she returns back to her father's domain, since she's still in that age when she's a Nara, she hasn't reached yet Bagrut, full majority. V'chol Shetider, and whatever she, vows she makes in the future, the, husband, the father excuse me, can continue to nullify as he did before she got betrothed. 
If the father dies after the woman becomes betrothed, and she makes a vow after his death, the husband still cannot nullify the vows. As we said, the husband can only nullify his wife's vows after she enters the chupa with him. And here, since they're only betrothed, no such thing. A girl who is betrothed made a vow. Her father hears about the vow, so he's got now one day to nullify it, that's it. But the husband didn't hear about it yet. He did, so he, he didn't even come into the picture yet, because he only has the power to nullify once he hears about it. And a funny case happens. Halacha has to address all types of funny cases. She gets divorced. This husband decides to break up with her and gives her a divorce that day. And she gets re-betrothed to somebody else on the same day. Even a hundred times. The point is, since the original husband never heard about the vow till that marriage was broken up and a new marriage began, the father and the most current, the latest husband, can nullify the vows that she made together with the original first husband. Because since she's a nara, since she's a maiden, in her father's jurisdiction, she never left to her own domain for even one second. After every guy, potential husband, broke up with her, she returns to her father's domain. She's still in her father's possession because she is between the ages of 12 and 12 and a half. And therefore, because she never assumed her own halakhic identity, her father and her latest husband retained the right to nullify her vows. But if the same scenario would play out for a regular married woman, she's a married woman, she makes a vow, her husband didn't nullify it, he divorces her and remarries her on the same day, now he cannot nullify the original vow. Because after she made the original vow and he divorced her, she went into her own domain. Even though at the time of the vow she was in his domain. Now she's back in his domain. Since in the interim she went out to her own jurisdiction, her vows have been certified. A girl who is again betrothed, she's both in her father's domain and in her husband's domain, she makes a vow. Nobody heard about it, not her father, not her husband. She gets divorced from this arus, from this man, and gets re-engaged to another man. Even after multiple days. Since the obligation to nullify only arises on the day that they hear about it, and the father and the husband didn't hear about it to begin with, when the father and the latest husband will hear about the vow, they will be able to nullify the vows that she made in front of the first husband, since the first husband never heard about them, and therefore he never became part of the authority over her to nullify it. A girl is engaged, and she makes a vow. And the father hears about it, and this time, unlike the last halacha in halacha number 11, he hears about it, and he nullifies the vow. So he already did his part. But the husband dies before he has a chance to, hear, to even hear about it. And she gets re-engaged to somebody else the same day, even to a hundred people. The father, who already nullified the vow, can combine together with the latest husband and nullify the vow which she made in front of the first husband, who died before he had, he had a chance to hear about it. Um, because the father already nullified the vow, whatever rights the original husband had already became weak, and now that he died, it can get transferred to the next husband who can do it and take it over. The opposite. The husband was the one who heard the vow, nullified it, and died. Then the father hears about it. And she gets engaged with somebody else on the same day. So here, both the father who heard about it um, in, the, in the initial state and the newest husband can nullify her vow together, and we don't even have to look about the fact that the original husband nullified it. Now there's a father and a new husband in the picture. Let them both nullify it. The father heard the vow. The husband didn't hear the vow. And the husband dies the same day. Or the husband did hear about it. He nullified the vow. Or at least he was quiet. And dies on that day. Now that the husband has died, the 
jurisdiction of the daughter is emptied back into the hands of the father, and the father, because he's still alive and heard about, about it on that day, can nullify the vow alone. If the husband had heard the vow, and not only did he hear about it, but he maintained it, he said, yeah, good vow, I like it, and then he dies, or he heard about it and he was silent, and he didn't die that same day. He died the next day, the father can no longer nullify the vow. If the husband hears about the vow and just divorces her, what does that divorce mean? We're in doubt. Is the divorce to be treated as silence? It's not a certification. It's not a nullification. So he pulls himself out of the picture. And now the father with any future husband can nullify the vow. Same day. Or is the divorce like a certification? The husband maintained the vow and now it's maintained and the father can no longer nullify the vow. We don't know. If the father hears about the, the vow, nullifies the vow, and then dies, and only afterwards the husband hears about it, or at least he hears about it. But that's all before the father dies. When the father dies, jurisdiction is not emptied into the hands of the husband. A husband who is only prospective, who hasn't actually married his wife yet, is never able to nullify his wife's vows after the father's death. A prospective husband can only nullify a vow in partnership with a father. No father, no nullification. So, that's it? Forever? Forever. The vow is good. She has to keep the vow. If she wants to nullify that? Go to a rabbi, like a regular case. Yeah. Yeah. The husband hears the vow. He nullifies the vow, then he dies, and the father hears about it. And then the, or the father hears about it, nullifies the vow, and the husband dies before he has a chance to hear. Since these vows were fitting to be nullified by the first husband, the father can no longer alone nullify the vows, unless she gets re-engaged the same day and the second husband peers up with him, then they can nullify the vow together. And the difference between this halacha and three halachas before is that over there, in, the, in three halachas ago, the father didn't nullify the vow before the husband died. And therefore, the right never was weakened, and therefore it transfers back to the father, and he can nullify it on his own. Over here, the father nullified the vow and already weakened it before the husband died. And therefore, at this point, he can no longer assume that uh, power, unless there's another husband involved who comes into the picture later and nullifies the vow together. A woman makes a vow, and her father alone, he's the only one who nullifies it. And the husband only hears about it after he's fully married to her. After the chuppah. Now, he can no longer nullify it. Because it's interesting, a husband, once you're married, can't retroactively nullify the vows that his wife made before they were married. Before she comes into his possession, he can nullify it with partnership of the father. Otherwise, no. Therefore, it was the custom of Torah sages, before they would release their daughters from their possession, the father would always say, any vows you made in my house are nullified. In other words, this was a way of like getting rid of all problems in advance. Before you let her go, cancel all the vows. And same thing with the husband. Before he takes her into the chuppah, he tells her, any vows which you made from the moment I betrothed you till you come into my house are nullified. And here, the husband can nullify the vows of his wife even though he never heard them. And therefore, by saying that statement before the chuppah, he takes care of all potential problems. What qualifies as going into the, the possession? So remember, we have these different cases. These were like cases when it came to Kiddushin. If... Uh, because there can be, you know, a father can send off his daughter with agents, and a husband can hire agents to bring the, the girl to his house. So, here, we'll just call it, you know, we'll go in these categories here. The woman, you have the husband, the husband's agents, the father's agents, and the father. So the father goes together with the husband's agents, taking his daughter to the husband's house. 
or at least the father's agents go with the husband's agents together. Since the, the father, or at least his agents in some way, are still holding on, they can still nullify the girl's vows together with the husband. Once the father hands off the girl to the husband's agents. Or the father's agents pass the girl on to the husband's agents. At this point, the father loses his right to nullify vows. Because she left his jurisdiction. But the husband cannot yet nullify the vows. Because at this point, any vows she made is considered to be before she was in his possession. And the husband in marriage cannot nullify vows from before marriage. We remember this. A little bit confusing laws, but the point is when a husband dies without children, the wife becomes a yivama, and she has a zika, she has a bond to the husband's brother, and before they get married, she's called a shemeres yavam. She's waiting in the wings to see what this guy is going to do. Afilu asaba yivama maimer. Even if the yavam gave her a ring, as was customary, it's like an initial stage of the yibum process, afilu yavam echad yivama achas, even if there's only one brother and only one wife, so they're for sure going to get married. He cannot nullify her vows till he actually has relations with her and consummates the yibb. Let's say this woman who was supposed to be his yivama was actually engaged to the brother. She wasn't fully married to the brother. She was only engaged to the brother. And the father is still alive. He doesn't take the place of his brother and now say, oh, him and the father of the girl can nullify the vows together. The father has all the rights. He gets to nullify all the vows. Even if the yavam did ma'amar, he gave the ring to the, to the woman, we don't treat her like a regular engaged woman. Because ma'amar, the ring in preparation for yibum, isn't like a ring in preparation for a regular marriage which fully acquires the woman. This ring doesn't fully acquire the woman. If a girl was married off by her father and she's widowed or divorced from that marriage, even though her father's alive, she's considered to be an orphan in her father's lifetime. In other words, she's out of his domain. The father can no longer nullify her vows even though she's still in the state of 12, 12 and a half. She's still a naira. A girl was engaged, betrothed, and she made the vow. And neither her father nor her husband heard about the vows until a point where she entered her own jurisdiction. She either reached full majority or the marriage ended and she became a living orphan. Because nobody nullified the vow, her vows are maintained. The husband can no longer nullify the vow. Because she left her father's jurisdiction. And the father is his only partner. If the father is not allowed to nullify the vow, neither can he. She didn't go into the possession of the husband fully. And therefore he doesn't have the right. And therefore in this case, her vows would be fully maintained.